when she got up to try to walk, baby, my back started hurting. She could barely move. I was holding my back like, come on now. Take a little step, girl. Take a little step, girl. Every little step we take, you know. <laughs> What's up, everybody? Welcome back to my Twisted Life TV. I am Poetry. You are here for another recap and review of The Handmaid's Tale, Season 3, Episode 2, Mary and the Marthas. I'm going to tell y'all, yesterday I had some family issues going on, and then I got sick. I don't know if y'all can hear it in my voice, but I'm sitting here with a lot of snot rags right now because it's draining. So excuse me throughout the video. If I got to dab my nose, I'm going to try to pause so y'all won't hear all the, you know what I'm saying. So anyway, I'm going to try to start this video off a little different this week. I want to give some shout outs to a couple people. There were a few of you who um made similar comments. Wait a minute, come on, my dog on there. No? Hope I didn't just eat whatever was on my lip. Okay, there were a few of you who made comments to answer my question. Who do y'all think called the police? Um, so we got, uh, I'm just gonna name a few names. Farrah Montgomery, she believed it was Commander Lawrence. Um, uh, Sh Shanice Duckett, or was it Sharice Duckett? Sharice Duckett had said that she thought it was Mrs. Um, McKenzie who had called. Uh, the resistance said it was Fred, you know, when he's, uh, after Serena Joy touched him, wait a minute, that he's the one who called the police. And then, um, but the overall consensus in the comment section was that it was Commander Lawrence who called the, uh, the police while June was at the McKenzie's. I was kind of on the fence about that. I thought it was him at first, but it didn't make sense to me why he would go back, pick her up, and then take her to that house just to call the police on her. And then demand that she... Uh, uh, Request that she comes from the red center to his house. That just didn't make sense to me. He already had her with him. So he could have very easily just took June to the house with him. But nobody would have known. No one would have known Liza. Um, oh, it was an eyelash. I just took it off my lip. Okay, so I was kind of ruling out Commander Lawrence. But this particular episode um, had me looking real crazy at him. Something ain't right with that man. It's some noodles loose up in the brainer. Something, mm, 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 something ain't right with him. So I'm kind of thinking maybe he is, he might have been going back and forth. He liked to assert his authority. Remember, he is the creator of the, he's the one who came up with the idea for the colonies to help fund Gilead. So he has a, a slight vindictive side to him as well. And, you know, his wife is the one that's supposed to be having some mental issues. But I'm thinking that he a little has a little schizophrenia herself. That's what it seems like to me. So I'm not too sure if it, Commander Lawrence did it, but you know, it's very possible. But that is the overall consensus in the comment section that Commander Lawrence is the one who called the police. Um, I'm kind of leaning more to a Sharice uh, Duckett's answer that Mrs. McKenzie is the one who did it because Frances, who was her Martha, said that Mrs. McKenzie was asleep. Mrs. McKenzie was asleep, baby. Remember, she got up, she had that robe on and everything. And, yeah, I, I think that Mrs. McKenzie may have called as well. So, I also asked the question, uh, why do they keep letting June get so many damn chances? Why does she keep getting so many damn chances? And Nisha, Nisha Need 13, said that the bitch fertile. She got a fertile womb. Of course, they're going to keep giving her chances. She ain't harmed nobody which is, or try to kill any children, which is what Emily and Janine did, even though they were fertile women, that's what they did to get them sent to the colonies. So, yeah, I could I could probably roll with that. It's because she has a fertile womb that they keep giving her chances. If she had tried to harm other people, then maybe. With, with the exception of the fact that stealing a baby is considered harmful of children. But since they blame this on Emily and not on June, because you know they try to save face, they steal their story. It's very possible why Nisha D may be right. Nisha D thirteen may be right on that. All right, and Shelby Petty, she asked, "What was up with that fucking song that played when uh, Serena Joy burned the bed? That burn, baby burn. What was up with that damn song? Um, I didn't know. I was confused as hell. It didn't make no sense. It seemed so happy go lucky, like." I didn't get it. 
So this morning I did look up the words, research it. It is a song, it was written in 1979. It was sung by the Boomtown Rats. It was called, I Don't Like Mondays. So when I look at the lyrics, we are gonna go through them for a minute and then we are gonna get into the recap. When I look at the uh, lyrics here, it starts off saying that the silicone chip inside her head gets switched to overload. I can kind of see how that relates. Like Serena Joy typically has been walking through this in a very robotic state of mind. Um, a lot of you believe that she is being controlled by this system as well. I still stick to my feeling that you sleeping in the bed that you made, bitch. That's how I feel about it. But I can see where she's in this robotic state of mind. And all of a sudden, she's in overload mode. And this song, first of all, was written after a mass school shooting. And the person who wrote the song, when they interviewed her and asked her, why did she write it? She said, you know, because it live is up today. I don't like Mondays. And so that's where this song came from. So in the song, the lyrics go, nobody's going to school today. She's going to make them stay home. And daddy doesn't understand it. He always said she was good as gold. And if you think about the conversation that Serena Joy had with Fred, he was saying how good of a woman she was, that God blessed him with this woman that is, is like gold to him, but he still treated her like shit. So he don't understand why she's so mad because, you know, he, he don't get her issues. What the hell is wrong with you? This is the way the world is. And Serena's like setting his bed on fire. Just like Fred said, everything's going to go back to normal. I was saying, Serena Joy set that bed on fire and say, no, it's not. Ain't nobody going to school today. You know what I'm saying? But daddy ain't going to understand. Fred is the daddy. He's not going to understand. Um, like I said, he always says she's good as gold. And as he can see, no reason. He don't even understand why she's so good. Because uh, there are no reasons. What reason do you need to be sure? Oh, 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 tell me why I don't like Mondays. Tell me why I don't like Mondays. I want to shoot the whole day down. I'm kind of skipping over some of the words here. Um... One of the lyrics that really stood out to me was says, all the playing stopped in the playground now. Like, she's done. She's done. She's done playing this game. I understand. You know, I went outside. I brought all the toys. <laughs> now she want to play with her own little toys for a while. That's the next lyric. School's going to get out early and we'll soon be learning. And the lesson of the day is how to die. Um, she's wanted, She wants to kill the whole system at this point now. She... But we want to cheer. We should be. <laughs> the consensus is to cheer for Serena Joy in this moment. Like I said, I still don't have any feelings for her. But at this point, like I said, she, she wants to dismantle the system herself for her own selfish ass reasons as well. But still, she wants to dismantle the season. And she's saying, um, and the lesson today is how to die. And then the boy home crackles. And the captain tackles with the problems of the hows and the whys. He can see no reasons because there are no reasons. What reasons do you need to die? And so then it goes back to the, the verse about the silicone switch being flipped in the head. And nobody's going to school. Daddy don't understand it. He always says she was good as gold. He can't see no reasons because there are no reasons. What reasons do you need to be sure? Tell me why. I don't like Mondays. Tell me why. So that's pretty much the lyrics all together. So would you kind of like put those lyrics up against what could have possibly been going through Serena Joy's head in that moment? You kind of understand why I Don't Like Bundy's was, I guess, a fitting song for that scene in that moment. So I hope I was able to answer all your questions. I'm going to try to like, um, at the beginning of each video these days, I'm going to try to like go through a few of the comments and address them directly in the next video. So I hope y'all don't mind that. All right, so at nine minutes, we're going to get right into this recap, Mary and the Martha's. All right, so June, she got a new walking partner. While she's sitting there waiting on uh, the new walking partner to show up, you see Janine walk by, Alma walk by, and Janine look over like, hey, girl, hey. I see you, boo. I see you. You know, the new walking partner is named, um, walking partner is named a Matthew. Um, now, remember the Matthews, a Matthew, a Matthew, or Matthew, his house was the one that was burning down at first across the street. I believe that's the, yeah, it was supposed to be Matthews. Okay. So, a Matthew tells her, like, we're about to take back Chicago. 
I, I was thinking take back Chicago. So the American government did a little something, something, you know, and they was able to take over a city again. Um, maybe the Chicago people rose up. Y'all know how the south side of Chicago people can be? Or is that the west side? Maybe it's just all of Chicago. They can be a little bit about it. I'm just saying. So maybe they took over and rose up in Chicago. Or maybe it was the American government stepped in. But what Matthew is saying right now is that we, Gilead, is going to take back Chicago. They really going to take it back, which is a sad state to hear, a sad thing to hear that she, they're going to take it back. Um, but the Matthew look happy as hell that Gilead is going to do this. You know, Gilead is fighting back. Okay. I'm like, who the fuck is this dweeb? Who is she? And right when I said it, June said, so who is this pious little shit? I'm saying, I'm saying, exactly, girl. Who the fuck is you? She getting on my nerves already. Um, she kind of looked like Monica, though, the singer. But I don't think that wasn't, I know that wasn't Monica. Anyway, she see Alma. In the store, when she give her this little cold, like, hey, gonna meet me by the tomatoes, right? We're gonna have a little talk to talk. Casey, uh, one of the other handmaids, had just heard her baby, and her baby was born with the heart outside of his body. Oh, but I heard that. That just touched me so, y'all. Y'all know I wanna go be um, a NICU cuddler, where you go down to the NICU and you hold babies who need body warmth, and maybe their parent is not able to do so. I wanna go do that, but I just, I love baby so much. I think it's just going to fucking break me to do it. And um, this just instantly put me in mind of what type of babies I may encounter if I do sign up for that. And in this particular world, they call those babies shredders. They throw them away. That's exactly what they do with a baby that has a defect. They throw them away. Um, but I was curious as to why June was asking Alma, has she spoke to her Martha about the McKenzie's? Why at this point would you be asking about the McKenzie's from Alma when you already know where the dog on McKenzie's at? What information do you expect Alma to give you? Um, they didn't. They ain't just up and move. You know they didn't do that. I'm drinking cranberry juice this morning. Y'all, kind of help me with my my sinuses and the, the drainage and all that stuff. Anyway, so Alma's like, you know, the Martha's don't trust us. And I think we're good, right? Especially in, in regards to June. After all that they did, all they risked to help her get out, and there she is. She didn't get her butt on the doggone truck, and she back in captivity. As Martha, I wouldn't trust her either. I wouldn't trust her either. But it was kind of weird, though, well, once we got to Commander Lawrence's house, how even though the Beth and Cora are part of the Marthas, and you can see that there's a little tension between them, they still were very willing to bring her into the fold. I was kind of shocked about that. So, if anybody can remember why Commander Lawrence has two Marthas, drop that down in the comment section. Because we got Beth. You know, she's the one with the little quick lip. <laughs> and we have Cora. You know, the one that, uh, who has the eye has been messed up. So, Cora come in and tell her, hey, you got company. You got company. And we go into the living room like, who is it? Hey, auntie. <laughs> no, I can't even give her that type of respect. She is not that type of auntie. We're going to leave her as just Aunt Lydia. Aunt Lydia is back in the game, y'all. She's sitting there coming down to see um, how her little best gal is doing. Lawrence is like, and I'm just going to call him Lawrence instead of Commander Lawrence sometimes. He's just like, hey. She here spying on us. No, 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 no. I'm just catching up with my best buddy. You know what I'm saying? You know, she can get a little out of pocket sometimes. Lydia was throwing all the shade left and right, left and right. She was throwing jab, jab, jabs at Jim Nance. And um, uh, Mrs. Lawrence was looking at her. Eleanor was her first name. She was looking at her like, hey, y'all, I'm ready to go. Just, uh, can, are we done with this? Are we done? Are we done? You know? So Lawrence is going to take her back to her room. And then she's getting up. She looked real sick. Um, she's sweating. She, look, she she kept grabbing her side like she was in pain. Her hair was all frazzled. And uh, when they left out the room, my lady was like, what the fuck is wrong with her? Like, what is wrong? She thinks that Commander Lawrence is not on the up and up. She like, look, her Emily was only her two damn days. You know what I'm saying? Ain't no telling what the fuck he did to that girl to make her react the way that she did. <laughs> so if something's going down with him, you better let me know. She was like, all right, you know, I don't know what's up with the wife, but okay, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to let you know. I'm going to let you know. 
Now, we know doggone well that, like I said, he didn't do anything to Emily. But just like I was saying in the beginning, he acted a little schizophrenic at times. I, I don't know how to really read him um, other than the fact that he likes this cat and mouse game and he likes women who assert themselves, but he has to be in control himself. He still has to be in control. He doesn't want to be, I forgot I had a call drop. Um, he doesn't want to be as inhumane. And I got two different ones, one for my eye and one for my nose. So I ain't put my snot tissue in my back of my eye. Um, he doesn't want to be as inhumane as to be having sex with these women because I think he genuinely loves his wife which is what Fred and Serena are lacking at this time. He generally loves his wife. and He doesn't want to call her any more undue pain by going through that physical act of having sex with another woman and having her hold him down. She's already mentally fragile. You know what I'm saying? But um, he, he a little cuckoo. He a little cuckoo himself. I got to be a call drop, y'all. Y'all just don't understand. And this damn thing is powerful. Ooh. Okay. <clears throat> so, baby, Emily did a number on Aunt Lydia, baby. Did a number on her. I tumbled down the stairs to help her at all either. So, when she got up to try to walk, baby, my back started hurting. She could barely move. I was holding my back like, come on now. Take a little step, girl. Take a little step, girl. Every little step we take, you know. <laughs> And then she wanted to go up them stairs, and she couldn't lift that foot. She couldn't crinkle up that toe to get that foot moving. <laughs> and she came tumbling down. I'm like, you better fall, heifer. <laughs> At first, I thought that when she got to the stairway, she was going to look up and see herself falling down. She's going to have a flashback, but that didn't happen. She got a whole grown-ass attitude, though, because she couldn't climb those fucking stairs. And June, like, well, maybe another day. <laughs> That bitch had the nerve to cattle prod her ass for being nice. That's what the fuck you get, June. Stop trying to be nice to these motherfuckers who ain't been nice to you. Stop it. Y'all right. She has the classic Stockholm Syndrome. I, I almost like the Helsinki Syndrome. No, the one that, that uh, says that she starts feeling sympathy for her captors. That's what she, She's not just aligning with them. She got sympathy for them. She has the is it Helsinki. I think it's the Helsinki Syndrome. I'll correct it in the, uh, on the screen if I H E L S E N K I. Wait a minute, I got my tablet. No, I ain't looking up because that we I mean we already short of time. I'm already late with this video, so anyway, but I'll put it on the screen if I can find it. Um, but <laughs> we did find out that uh, everybody does know what happened at the McKenzie's. That June showed up at the McKenzie's. She was like, you know, you know, Aunt Elizabeth gave you too many fucking chances. I wouldn't have gave you a second chance. Um. I would have had your ass hanging up on the wall for what you did at the McKenzie's. I was saying the same thing. June is getting too many fucking chances. Too many chances, right? She'd have been hanging up on the damn wall in the colonies, one of the two. But, uh, you know, like Nisha Need 13 said, the bitch got a fertile womb. She got a fertile womb and it has benefits. So anyway, Commander Lawrence act like he really don't care one way or the other, you know. Like, June getting on his damn nerves. Whatever happened to you, happened to you at this point. Um, and so, he was like, I just wonder how many votes was in that doggone <laughs> cattle prod. And then turned and walked away. June looked like, he was like, motherfucker, really? That's that's what you... You know what I'm saying? I thought you was here to help. That's basically what she was saying um, in that look. She didn't say no words, but she gave a look to his ass, though, when he walked away. But anyway... Lydia has said that she got prodded because she was gossiping the store, which was she, really she was doing, but Lydia didn't know that. But that was the excuse that she gave um, Commander Lawrence. And um, he know, though. He know that the real reason why Aunt Lydia is so mad is because June is still here. That's all it really is. She's still here. Not here is the fact that she didn't get away. But just the her, the fact that she here, period, you know what I'm saying, still existing and breathing in this world after all the shit she has done against the Gilead way, which I know Aunt Lydia is so dead set on following, you know what I'm saying? So, we go up to Canada. And switch cheeks. Y'all see, you got a little puffy on there. We go up to Canada. Emily is really finding it hard to cope with her freedom. She doesn't know what to do. And it's very um, daunting to her 
so that everyone is walking around being normal, like nothing ever happened, you know. Um, it's just normal or regular life, and she's been held in captivity for seven years. Basically, what she's going through is PTSD, it's post traumatic stress disorder. Um, she's nervous all the time, she's fidgeting, she speaks mostly in short sentences, she can't make direct eye contact. And like, nobody is really, she's kind of invisible at this point because she's just back in the everyday, everyday flow of things and she doesn't know how to handle it. You know, they say that about people that go to jail, that's been in prison for a long time. When they get put back on the street, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to properly incorporate themselves back into society. And they're prisoners. She was a prisoner, you know what I'm saying? So that is um, what she's dealing with at this point. She just don't know what to do. Like she can't find her place. That's a better way to say it. She can't find her place. Um, she hasn't reached out to her wife and her kid yet. And Luke, old insensitive ass, is like, what's she going to do that? Like, why is she here all the time? Oh, she got a family here. And, you know, we already don't like Luke. We already don't like Luke. But I, 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 I kind of get it. Because she's a constant reminder that his wife ain't there. And later on in the episode, he makes mention... Um, when they talk, when they, him and Warren was talking about Nicole and holding the baby, because he wasn't even you no know, fucking with the baby at first, but later on the episode, you know, he's finally trying to bond with her. It was like June is doing what I couldn't do, and that's save our children. You know what I'm saying? And because like Emily has said that your, your wife saved me. I, I, you know what? June didn't save you, Emily. I'm sorry, June didn't save you. Commander Lawrence saved you. Um, I know that June had gave you some encouraging words throughout the seasons, but to be honest, Janine was the one who was really feeding you a faith-based mindset. It wasn't June. You know, June gave you a couple few words about your son and how uh, you still his mama, this, that, and the third, but it was Janine who was really kicking it into you. When y'all was down to them colonies, Janine is the one who was really giving you some hope when there was, it just seemed like there was none left. Um, but she feels like June saved her and she told Luke this and Luke is feeling like, damn, she out here saving motherfuckers and I ain't did shit. Same thing we had been saying. You ain't did a damn thing. You ain't even attempted. You ain't even tried to go back and find a kid. It's been seven years and you just safe up there in the compounds of Canada. You ain't even making no way to figure out how you could do anything different to get them. But at this particular time, he's trying to make sure that, um, Holly is being naturalized. And I can't call that baby Nicole. I can't call that baby Nicole. Um, did I write down that person's name? One of the commenters I forgot has said that the reason why Nicole is being called um, Nicole is a tribute to Nick. Um, I totally disagree with that. Uh, because Serena Joy is the one that named that baby Nicole. And like I uh, said to her in the comment section, she did that to spite Fred. Just as a reminder that that was Nick's baby and not yours. Remember, she told Fred that it wasn't his, it was Nick's baby. And I think she named the baby Nicole just to spite Fred. Um, so when, cause when June named her Holly after her mother, and when she introduced the baby to Nick, She's like, her name is Holly, you know, um, and I, I just don't think that that was a tribute to Nick at all. I think that was a connection to Serena Joy, you know, as we've been seeing this, this bond developing time and time again, this is going to be a long video. We've been seeing this bond develop time and time again between her and Serena Joy. That was to connect and to bridge her to Serena Joy. In my opinion, you know, I got to say that in my opinion. <laughs> well, back at the crib with June, she's trying to find some salve, you know, for her little cattle prod burn. And she comes up on the Martha's having a little secret convo in the kitchen. There's a new Martha in there. They're trying to help her escape. I was like, okay, we finna learn about this little underground railroad. But Breath is like, um, girl, telling this to Corey, we, you doing too much. We don't move people. We mean move contraband, you know, messages. We don't move people. So when they tried to help June, that was probably the first time that they ever did that. 
So it's not really an underground railroad that they have. They have a system of uh, filtering information in and out, but moving physical people is not something that they do, Beth was saying. So, I mean, look what happened when they tried to help June. Um, but June, she got herself involved in this conversation, like, hey, let her stay here. I was like, girl, you barely there. What the hell? What you mean, let her stay there? Well, Commander Lawrence come in, like, oh, who this woman? Who is this woman? Cora said, you know, she's just helping us. Liar. <laughs> he is quick. Liar. Mm -mm. So he's like, okay, I'm going to let you get back home. We're going to get you a guardian and take you to the crib. June rush in after him, like, come on. Hey, let us stay here. He's like, I don't like strangers in my doggone house. I'm a stranger. You helped me. You didn't know me. He's like, is that what you think I did? Is that what you think I did? I was kind of confused right there. I was like, what you mean? Is that what you think I did? Because she said, you didn't know me. You know, is he saying, I do know you? I know your kind. Or is he saying, I didn't help you? Which one was it, Commander? Let's break it down for me. If y'all got an idea, drop that on down in the comment section. So she played her case to him. He was like, okay, whatever. Your funeral. You can stay. Um, I don't think it really took any convincing him. I, I just wanted to, I just like that he, I think he just wanted to see how the game is going to play out. That's what I'm thinking. He likes the cat and mouse game. I just want to see, he just want to see how it's going to play out. He's not going to get involved. You want to help him, help him. Your funeral, your funeral, right? I'm saying, but she thinks she's manipulating him. Mm -mm. Don't be too sure of yourself, there, June. Don't be, it's something about that man, something ain't right with him. I don't know what it is yet. Had put my finger on it, something ain't right with him. So, anyway, it's time to move with Allison. Cora, like, I ain't going, yeah, you know, it's too risky for her. But Beth, like, I can't go by my dog myself. So, June volunteered herself a tribute. She kind of forced her way into the conversation, like, y'all owe me anyway. If it weren't for me, y'all would all be interrogated. I was like, bitch, please, shut the fuck up. They don't owe you shit. You owe the Marthas, for real. Come on, let's be honest. But like Miss Honey said, I digress for now. Just for now. So, they off. June dressed as a little Martha. Getting to see the, how they move through the community. You know, they get to go in parts of towns that the handmaids can't go in. Um, and I guess they don't need to go in pairs because June is walking alone. They make it to the checkpoint. Clear, you know, everything good there. Some of the Marthas, though, was giving them strange looks. And um, they get to this factory. They tell her, you know, stay here. Somebody will come find you. I was like, you remember that, June? They did the same thing for you, right? Okay, so Allison is like, she ain't going to Canada. Well, back to her, Allison ain't going to Canada. Like, she makes palms. She, that's why she's a chemistry teacher. She's very valuable to the, to the cause. Um... And it's like like the bombs that was made in season two, episode six, my favorite episode when they blew up that fucking red center. Yes, baby. So this is the job that she can do. And I'm like, okay, yes, get her to safety. We need her. We got work to do. We got work to do. But as I said, it was some walkers that was looking at them real sideways when they was walking up in there. And as June and uh, Beth are headed back, some guardians rush in. I was like, oh, baby, we got trouble. We got trouble. Well, they back at the crib, and I'll be damned. Allison has returned. She done returned with the woman who's been shot by the Guardians. This must have been the woman who she was going to meet, you know, to take her to her next destination. I was like, why did this bitch bring her to the commander's house? But she said it. I didn't know where else to go. I didn't know. So they there. This girl leaving blood all on the wall. What the hell she grabbed that damn wall for? <laughs> Put your damn blood ass all on the wall. Commander come down like, who the hell is in my house? Okay, Cora spoke up again. Lie. Lie number two, girl. Like, now, June, you try. And you better make it make sense, right? So, he was not having it today. He's like, get her the heck out of my damn house. Y'all stay putting other people at risk. And I just, I just don't. Cora and Beth both seem to have, like, some trepidation about what they were doing. But June feels like she is entitled to do this shit. Without looking at the fucking consequences of how it's gonna affect other people, so he like get it the hell, get her gone. The guardians here knocking at the motherfucking door and everything. Commander Lawrence gonna invite them in for some little tea and crumpets and shit. I told you he liked this game. He kind of want to see what the, how they gonna react and if they gonna get caught or whatever. He invited them in for their little tea and crumpets. It was coffee, but I'm saying tea and crumpets. It's blood on the wall. The June can't clean off fast enough. Luckily, Eleanor is lucid right now. She come on down. 
and she just know had it the intuition to take them into the study and she gonna go make the drinks she called Cora like come on let's go do this and see that damn blood on the wall see in June go do what the hell you was gonna do down in that basement Cora you clean that shit up you clean it up right that girl down in that basement panting all extra hard and loud and I'm like look sis calm down I understand you in pain but you got to chill right now and June was telling her the same thing come on I need you to be quiet his flashlights coming all through the window. They ain't looking to and fro. And she, <laughs> shut the fuck up. <laughs> I think June even told her, shut the fuck up for a minute. She rushed over there to her, dragged her body down to the ground and covered her mouth up. Dead. She was dead. I don't think it was the fact that June covered her mouth up. It may have been that June moved the body. The body might, the blood, uh, the, the bullet may have moved inside her because she was internally bleeding. So the body was probably still lying to her body. Y'all medical professionals, if, if y'all out there, I think that's how that works. If the body blood, is, the bullet is still in the body, you have a lot of internal bleeding. And if you move, it can move, shift a little bit. I know she walked a long way there, but still. Anyway, um, she quiet now. She quiet now. <laughs> no, June breaks on down like, shit, fuck. Um, she sent Allison her way. Like, you got to get out of here for command to Lauren. See you. You know where you got to go. You got to do what you got to do. Hey. This is this is the life she signed up for. She knew what she was gonna get into. Commander Lawrence come through and say, Oh, really? We got dead bodies down in my basement. Really? Okay. So I was wrong. It wasn't your funeral. It's somebody else's. <laughs> Clean this shit up. Clean this shit up, right? So June, of course, trying to get all buddy buddy with him. You know, she trying to her manipulation thing that she do with Fred. Ask him how Mrs. Lawrence is doing. Baby, his voice rose them 10 octaves. <laughs> he turned them vocal tones up. You don't get to ask him about my wife. How dare you? You know, he, that's not his words, but it was something along that. You don't get to ask me about my motherfucking wife. Don't even put her her name in your motherfucking mouth, bitch, because you're trying me. You tested my patience. That's what you're doing right now. He's like, I do all this wrong. <laughs> I shouldn't have kept taking your ass in and helped your ass out. She keep taking this kindness for weakness. She really do. Like I said, cause she thinks she's manipulating him. But he right though. June is uh, one of them women that just do reckless shit without thinking of the consequences of other people. Y'all know I've been saying this left and right for a while now. So what do we call that? Selfishness. That is called being selfish. Now I know she was trying to help this woman at this particular time, but she doing it with the uh, uh, air that she has a right to um, discount what everybody else is going through, like the risk that everybody else is going to be put through because of her actions. Now, like I said, I know she was helping this other woman and, and Beth and Cora was uh, trying to help her as well. But the fact that she is trying to present herself like she's in charge and she knows what the fuck she's doing and she about about it the blame is being put on her that's why the blame is being put on her so june need to get rid of the body right and i was like why does the dead body weigh so doggone much um commander lawrence uh he was too thrilled with june he didn't even want beth to help her out there you know get rid of the body i thought that child was gonna have to dig that hole with her hands i was like lord when she found that shovel i was so happy um Somebody said, damn, I wish I could find that video. Somebody said they were so sick of June gazing into the camera with her. <laughs> her eyes. And at least seven times <laughs> from the time she started digging it old. <laughs> June had that far away gaze into the camera for a long time. I just fell out laughing. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing, y'all. <laughs> anyway, um, Damn, the commander done sent Cora away. She gone. We don't know where she going to. She probably at the colonies. But he don't like liars is what Beth said. You no, know, she told lie number two. He wasn't going to even let her get a chance to tell her the third lie. It's not going to happen around her. Um, like I said, back up in Canada, Lucas found a way to bond with that baby. And, um, you know, the fact that June is back there trying to rescue the child when he couldn't, it's a kick in his manhood. That's, it's really a kick in his manhood. So the next day, Eleanor is out there planting flowers over the freshly, fresh dug in, uh, the grave. Um, I thought June would have at least covered it up with leaves or at least gave her a head not to say thank you or something um, for not spilling the beans. And she off to the market with a Matthew. 
who just can't shut the fuck up. Oh, she gets on my nerves already. Anyway, June in so many words basically told her, I'm going to push your ass in front of the bus if you keep talking. Keep on talking about how the hand marriage deserved his life and how um, the Martha who died or the Martha who ran away was fucking ungrateful and didn't know how to appreciate the life she was given. Keep on talking. She got that hint. She got that hint. That bus rolled past her and she's like, oh shit, this bitch is threatening to push me in front of the bus. That's basically what she did. So, well, Aunt Emily, uh, she went to the eye doctor and I don't know, doing the whole session, she doctor kept you know, trying to, you know, they test your eyes, like, is this better or worse? Which one is better or worse? You know, I think I fail that test every time because I always have to go back and get my glasses redone. Um, I think she broke through a little of her PTSD and she finally decided to call her wife. Baby, her wife stopped traffic. She didn't even move the car. She was just in such shock. So I think this is going to be a good reunion between the two, which was she was fearing like how it was going to be to see her again. Um, but I think the uh, the eye doctor um, visit, along with all her other doctor visits, was very symbolic that she keeps wanting stuff to be wrong. She keeps wanting stuff to be wrong. Like when the doctor first doctor gave her her, her checkup, and she was like, that's it? Ain't nothing else? Just that's it? You know? And she was so focused on the fact, oh my God, I got cholesterol. She needs something to be bad for this to make sense to her. So I think when she was doing the eye test and she kept fo not focusing, she couldn't see clearly. She kept seeing the worst part. And then like when it's better, she couldn't ask me. You know, she had to keep taking her head away and telling me it's better. She had to keep blinking. Um, and she finally decided to focus on what she could see, on the possibility that things could get better. That's all I need is a little help, a little help along the way. And she got her glasses. I see her walk out with her glasses on. I think that was the first step of her seeing a clearer vision, of, uh, of the clearer picture that this life that she's in right now could be better. I just need her to snap out of it. I do, because I, I want Emily to raise up. I want Emily to raise up, y'all. That is the end of this episode. Thank y'all for being patient. Um, thank y'all for listening to me rattle. And um, yeah, like I said, I think I may start each episode next week. Um, just give me all some little feedback from the comments section in case y'all don't read all the comments. I appreciate you all being here. Like the video if you're so inclined to do so. Comment below as you always do. I'm trying to get to everybody's comments, but y'all know I'm backed up on the video, so I haven't been able to get to everybody's comments. And uh, subscribe to the channel if you're not already subscribed. And that way we uh, be here tomorrow for episode three. And then we'll be back on track on Wednesday for the rest of the season. Y'all have a good one. Peace.